All right, welcome everybody. Have quite a few folks still trickling in from the waiting room, but we wanna get started on time. So um, welcome to the first external Signified Crimes and Cocktails virtual event. Um, this was one of the, the most popular internal um, events that we, we do um, as kind of training and as sharing um, success stories um, within our company All Hands. And we decided that we would try to start externalizing that and then bring in our community of, of experts and, and customers and, and other folks who are interested in all things that fraudsters and um, less scrupulous consumers might try to do um, for our, uh, our commerce network. So welcome. We have about 40 minutes here of a, a pretty brisk um, agenda and there'll be um, lots of folks joining. Um, so please do keep yourself on mute. Um, there will be a breakout session where we'll get to be interactive and talk with some folks, um, kind of carefully put people into three different groups. So there'll be uh, fun little, little uh, breakout sessions. Um, also, there'll be a series of polls um, throughout, so please do participate. It makes things more interesting and more engaging. Um, and then also, uh, we have some gifts that we'll be sending out. So if we don't have you from uh, uh, participating in a poll, then unfortunately, we will not be able to send you a gift. So um, participate, please do. All right. So um, I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit. So uh, I'm Bennett. I go by Bennett, um, half for a couple decades. I um, in a prior life was outside counsel for Signified, um, starting with the American Express investment about five and a half years ago. Um, I head up our customer success teams, um, Ping's on my team, who will introduce herself here in a second, um, and love talking with all of our different clients from mom and pops all the way up to, to Walmart on the types of things that they're facing in this economy um, as they try to sell more, as they think about payments, as they think about customer experience, as they think about lifetime value. So really excited to talk with you today about their experiences and our experiences. So um, the other two panelists are two excellent folks from Signified. I'd like to welcome Ping Lee. She's the VP of Risk and Chargeback Operations. Ping, you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Bennett. Hi, my name is Ping Li. Uh, I'm the VP of Risk and uh, Chargeback Operations. I have been uh, at Signify for almost four years. Uh, prior to that, I've been in a, a payment processor called uh, uh, WePay for five years and running, uh, uh, building up the risk organizations there. And prior to WePay, I was at uh, uh, eBay and PayPal. Uh, both side trusted safety and payment risk management for 10 years. Uh, so my team here uh, at Signified consists of uh, fraud experts. We have a risk intelligence team. They're fraud experts who provide deep uh, dive data analysis and to uh, understand uh, fraud trends and working with our data science team to uh, enhance our models. And then our chargeback team is uh, uh, experts in uh, the chargeback uh, representment and help uh, to protect our merchants from um, friendly fraud. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ping. Um, and Eleanor Ritchie is also joining us today from the Signified side. She's our senior product manager and she specializes in the topic of today's webinar, um, our returns and abuse products. So Eleanor, can you introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Bennett. Um that quick intro so won't go over my title and what I do but I much like Bennett prior to this was actually a product manager at a signified merchant so experienced a lot of these problems and have been here for almost a, a little over a year now um building solutions to actually solve them so I'm excited to be talking about this today it's definitely my favorite area of abuse so your favorite area of abuse to talk about. Exactly. Uh, Not I, to I, experience. I it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Fun, fun stories. So um, for those of you who don't know Signified, uh, we're, we operate uh, worldwide and, and we have a few thousand merchants in our network. Um, and that's a lot of where we'll be pulling um, our stories from today. And then also uh, in, from in terms of like who we work with uh, from that perspective. So you already met us. We, we've done that. Gonna, gonna talk a little bit about the, the buyer's journey and uh, the state of commerce report. Like what are what are consumers seeing uh, in the macro economy? What's affecting probably all of us on this call? We'll talk a little bit about the recession and, and kind of what's what we expect to happen there in terms of you know next steps. 
Um, we'll then talk about what has been happening with consumers in terms of online, um, especially behavior changing in terms of returns. What are the ex expectations consumers have? Who's meeting those expectations? What opportunities does that create? What risks does that open up um, to those businesses? Um, then we'll have uh, about 10 minutes for Q&A and a breakout um, where we'll be able to kind of get into smaller groups and maybe share some stories that will not be recorded. I was assured of that. So we can be pretty candid with each other. Um, if you have some, some asks for advice or, or just want to share a funny story, that will be the, a great time to do it. Um, and then uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a wrap up as we join back together as a group. So I think that the um, first thing to do in terms of understanding what does Signify do, right? So you work with all these merchants, you work with all of these financial institutions, you have all of this data. Um, that to me was what um, drew me to Signify was to see, wow, this is really cool. All the interesting stuff that you can do. I like to say that Signify is a decisions company. What we do is we guarantee fearless commerce. And so the way that we make those decisions to guarantee fearless commerce is we have models and data checkpoints that go through um, the customer journey for someone who's gonna buy something in a card not present environment or in a digital environment um, uh, type of payment method. So you can see here kind of a, a customer journey and we, we start with, you know, maybe you have an account creation point, right? And you need to collect information to make a decision about, is this a bot or is this somebody who's creating another account so that they can take advantage of promotions. All of those types of decisions are actually really hard to make on the thin data set you have when you are a merchant, right? From that perspective, it's what are you collecting from that perspective? So Signified helps with um, that first process. Similar kind of questions at the login, which is what happens after they have created that account or they're, they're coming back to you. Is this the same person? Is, has someone taken over that account? Maybe someone else was breached and then they actually have you know, come to your site to see if they can take advantage of that breach from someone else. Might not even be your fault, right, from that perspective. So these are the types of problems that we would bundle or the industry oftentimes talks about as account protection. Then kind of move through in terms of, hey, we're gonna talk about how the most successful folks are adding different payment methods, their promotional periods and in, in terms of trying to get people to come in without having to spend money on acquiring new customers because the cost of ads is so high, because with the iPhone changes to privacy, the tracking is much less robust in terms of making sure you're targeting the right people. All of these types of things that we do to, to get customers more loyal, adding cards, adding payments, tokenizing, making sure the payment method of their choice is available, giving them small promotions to bundle. All those types of things are um, rife with fraud as well. Every one of these things allows folks who have less than scrupulous means to, to kind of go through and be like, all right, I'm going to take advantage of that. And I'm going to get 50% off five times instead of just the ones. Checkout is obviously the next stage of, hey, I've got what I want to do and I, I have a checkout decision to make. And then we make our core decision of, should I ship this? Yes or no? And we issue a financial guarantee on that. Where we're really going to focus today, though, is on the fraud protection piece with the abuse protection piece and how they kind of blur together. And I think that that's really important of these bad actors that are really taking a look um, at what they can do to get your product. That's what they ultimately want to do. They want to steal. Um, they don't really care how they do it. The modus operandi or kind of how they do what they do, Ping is going to talk about but they're very happy to shift and say, okay, well, if I can file uh, this type of chargeback, doesn't matter to me. If I can claim a free refund and I get my money back immediately, doesn't bother me. As long as I get the good and as long as I don't have to pay for it, you know, that's, that's what we're trying to avoid from that perspective. So we're really gonna focus on fulfillment, refund and return in today's um, experience. And some of the changes that we're seeing in the uh, economy, some of the changes we're seeing in market practice, how to know if you have a problem, and then also what can you do about it. All right, so one of the things that we put out that I think is, is really helpful to kind of talk about these things and put them into context is the State of Commerce 2022. It's a report, um, you all can access that. I wanted to just flash it up so you can kind of visually um, see what it might look like later, but really the summary, the high level um, that you should know is 
it's still about payments, right? Even when you're talking about refunds and you're talking about returns, the payment method matters, right? Because if you did a buy now, pay later, maybe your refund needs to be different than if it's a credit card, than if it's a full promotion and someone's taking advantage of, you know, kind of gift cards, all of those types of payments at the, at the core are going to affect how you should think about your refund and how you should think about kind of how you process a return. What we're seeing is this still has incredible upside for folks in terms of like five to 9% of folks that offer the right type of payments the consumer want and that are offering frictionless experiences. So payments are still very important and people are, are now starting to optimize their mix, their placement, their promotional periods for their payments. Number two, most relevant to today's webinar is returns are changing. The game is completely different an order of magnitude more than it was in 2019. The New York Times has reported on it. Forbes has reported on it. This is becoming a mainstream media um, kind of story about how people have completely changed the way they interact with retailers. And the, one of my favorite stats is 20% of consumers will admit to defrauding merchants from either filing false chargebacks or just straight up returning false goods. That's 20% of consumers that are willing to admit it in a poll. So that's a crazy amount of people who are willing to break the social contract because of whatever their expectations are for buying online. It's a very interesting stat to me that can so many consumers have that belief about what an experience should be like. And they're effectively willing to enforce that belief, regardless of what your terms of service says, regardless of what your policies are they're going to take it in their own hands to do that. That's setting aside the, the criminal fraud rings that, that Ping will talk about. So putting together that, that incredible rise in the number of returns, it's because consumers are demanding this, right? They want to be able to not only buy and get the items really quickly, they want to be able to drop it off at a locker, they want to be able to leave it on their porch, they want to be able to do it without a label. Like They want that utter convenience that is being kind of dictated a lot by Amazon leading into the fourth point, which is marketplaces are starting to really show value for people who know how to use them correctly. And if you have it as a distribution method and they're able to solve for you the distribution costs and logistics costs and managing all the other types of headaches that have come along with the macroeconomic conditions the last year and a half or so, the people who are using marketplace as well are doing that. Um, and that is like really, excuse me, that is leading to a kind of proliferation of options um, where other big players are opening really successful marketplaces. So those are four kind of key trends um, to talk about payments, returns, reverse logistics, and marketplaces. All right. So talk a little bit about that, that online returns sizing for you. It's the the actual total return volume is going to be about 200 billion um, in 2021. And so that amount is just absolutely staggering compared to, to what it was in the past. And the, the, this first bullet point is something that I think if you haven't read this, it's really just intriguing. Bob's refunding guide, just go Google it, take a quick gander through it. It's really intriguing to read from that point of view of, hey, how should I do a return? It's, this is becoming you know, kind of very commonplace in the, in the ethos of the uh, American consumer. So, and it's bleeding over into Europe now with the advent of PSD2, that kind of like, eh, well, if I didn't really like it, I, I, have, I have a recourse uh, regardless of everything else. So this is a big problem, right? From that perspective, getting much bigger. And it's, it's not peculiar, of course, to online, but it has been a huge shift in online compared to other retail. So this is how we know that this is a really um, impactful change. It's an inflection point for the folks in the card not present or other digital payment space is because returns are increasing. So it's broader consumer sentiment overall, but it's just four times as fast in terms of growth rate for online. So the folks are really you know, adopting the channel and the growth of online as a share of retail has actually kind of stayed at COVID levels. If you look at gas and cars and all the other things that are bought online, the, the, the penetration of online payments has gone up. So if it's four times 
as big as retail and the share of online is increasing, so it's going to become more and more of a, of a P&L item um, for all of us that are working in the space that we work in. So the, the silver lining to all of this is with, with this huge liability or this huge risk comes an opportunity to differentiate. And so the NRF has come out and said basically that, right? Hey, it's upsetting to see this increase, but if you actually do your returns well, if you offer that beautiful experience, it is a way to build brand loyalty, it is a way to build customer lifetime value. And the number one thing that people want when they buy is a good experience. The number two thing that will cause people to not come back is a bad returns experience. And so that I think shows the opportunity and customer lifetime value of, you gotta get it right. Um, this, this question of how can I give people the comfort that if it doesn't go well, that there's a way to there's a way to make it right that is easy fast and where I get my money back. So <clears throat> this leads to hey you got to you got to do something about it right it's it's 10x what it used to be 2 years ago right in terms of a size of a problem typically when an order of magnitude starts getting involved that's where you know strategic minds start thinking and strategic minds are going to develop cool strategies and then that's going to make you competitive in the market so what we found is you got to offer the best customer experience. You got to deter fraud and abuse, and you got to really understand kind of, hey, in my business, what does this return mean? How should I treat each individual return? Segmentation is actually not as helpful in returns. It's very helpful in marketing. You actually have to look at actually each transaction by transaction and understand what that consumer is trying to do. It's really hard unless you have um, you know, a data set that's really robust and broader than your own. All right, so we are to our first poll. Reminder, please, please, please go in the poll. It's just a simple yes or no, we're just warming up. So, hey, are you actively adjusting your strategy and policies for your returns? Um, based on what you've seen kind of in your business in the last 18 months. All right, and so please respond to the poll as a, as a reminder that that makes you eligible for the gift. We've got about 60% participation. So Bennett, up to you if you wanna share results yet. That's, that's awesome. I think actually Ping is gonna share the results as we hand it over to her. All right, can you all see? result yes yes so yeah great so 66 percent of you responded that you are responding to the changes and as we know the fraudsters are constantly changing their tactics and i'm really glad to to see your response so let me go to our next slide one second Hmm. Okay, here we are. Um, so I'd like to talk about the types of the online return abuse that we have seen in our networks. Uh, I think a lot of these probably are very familiar, you are very familiar with. Uh, on the left-hand side, the INR and SNAS, that's probably the most common uh, ones that probably very uh, you probably all see. So basically the, the customers uh, falsely claim that they either didn't receive the item or uh, it is not as described. Uh, and then in the middle, empty boxes and rock in the boxes, that is also we see very much increasing of this type of activities. Uh, and also a lot of the professional fraud that we see are involved in here. Uh, and then the, on the right-hand side, those that will we see the bracketing and uh, wardrobing, I think they're mostly happening in the, um, we see more happening more often in the uh, apparel industry uh, that are people either buying many different sizes, different colors, but they only keep one and return all the rest, or they are wearing it, they wear it out and then return. So those are, these are the typical uh, behaviors that we have seen, all right? The next one. So what do we have seen that fosters are doing? 
Um, and, and I think we know that they are going after um, the profit. They're maximizing their profit and they do actually a lot of research on our merchants return policies. They probably know monitoring, what you have been doing, what you have changed. So they, they have done lots of studies and for them, they will find what they see as the, the loopholes that they think they have better chance to, um, to kind of defraud our merchants. Um, that's what we see that they are constantly adopting as well. Um, and then they, I think for them, they are uh, really uh, going after the methods that they see that are most profitable for them. Uh, and we also see them that uh, they will try to stay uh, below the radar, right? They don't want to get detected. They don't want to get stopped or they don't want to get law enforcement uh, involved. So we see the tactic that they're trying to do or is really trying to get caught, not get caught. Um, and so what we have seen a shift recently, I think since COVID happened, um, just immediately after a few months that we see the professional fraud, the fraud rings get involved. Uh, the good merchants are telling us that the return label is not matching with where they shipped the label to. So basically uh, what they call it refunders or refunding schemes. So basically the fraudsters are offering services to the people in their network uh, to do it for the people who either are not good at it or they don't have the guts to do it. So they will, the fosters are actually, the professional fosters are now getting involved. And that's what we see kind of spike um, in from what we have seen. And also we have seen like uh, address manipulation that the, the same foster that if you can give exactly the same address, you are sending to the same address, but they are trying to kind of manipulate the address. So it looks, seems different, but it's actually the same. So that's what we see. Um, and then let's move on. So we'd like to do another uh, polling and we'd like to see what you have seen in the past uh, 12 months, have you seen increase uh, of abusive behaviors. Okay, thank you. So we have 20 some answerings. It will be great that if you can share um, your observations. Okay. So I think I will hand it off to uh, Eleanor. Perfect, thanks mm -hmm. Peng. Um, so many of you indicated that you've seen an increase, which is great, but then um, another sizable amount said it's hard to track. And I think that that is something that has been unique about returns abuse in particular, is that even if you know you have a problem, the quantification of that is hard. So really the questions that we encourage our merchants to look at as they're evaluating potential returns abuse, or if you're looking for how some of the changes you're making are affecting your entire customer journey, um, looking at some of our specific use cases, questions we want people to be able to know is how often are you doing item not received refunds? Do you do any tracking of those at all to see this person or this address seems to never get their stuff? That seems weird. Um, more than that, how much money are you spending doing customer service operations, just investigating each of these claims? All of that really contributes to your bottom line being bigger. In wardrobing, another important thing to look at as a side effect of returns abuse is how often are people returning? And when they are returning a lot, how much are you spending and shipping back and forth on these wardrobers? Or how much product do you have to damage out and write off? Another really important area where we, even if audits outset maybe doesn't look that expensive, once you kind of get under the weeds, it gets much, much bigger. And then the last one, I think this is one of the hardest questions to answer, but a really important one. Like Bennett mentioned earlier, people having a poor returns experience is one of the number one reasons that they'll never shop from you ever again. I think it was a stat that we pulled out from NRF that 75% of people, if they have a bad return experience, won't come back. 
So if that's the case and you have made changes to tighten up your policies, have you done an evaluation to see if your repeat rates or your customer lifetime value is being affected? So all of these are different hidden pockets that can be affected when you are experiencing returns abuse and maybe tighten it up to begin with um, instead of looking for other options. And then all of this is to say, you obviously wanna know how you can best protect yourself from all of this. Um, so these are some of the things that we recommend looking at as you're kind of looking at how to address your returns abuse problem. So the very first thing that's the most helpful and you've heard throughout this presentation is the power of having a network it means you can be proactive the first time you're seeing someone. Generally, let's say someone is coming to you claiming they haven't received items repeatedly, you're going to catch on to them pretty quickly. But by having the power of a network, you know that this person has tried this 10 other places and now they're coming to me. So you can handle them appropriately that first time. Another thing that then that network allows you to do is you can have customized return experiences. So for your very best customers that are coming to you, they get the red carpet, they get a label in their box, they get refunded instantly, they are happy as clams. Maybe they get a promo offer for their next order. But maybe for someone who's been not so great in the past, sure, they can still have a free return, but we're not gonna refund you until we inspect the item. So by having these different experiences, it means you can appropriately meet customers where they are. So then your good customers are never having to be punished for what a few bad actors are doing. And all of this really then allows you to be really intentional about the product that you are taking back as a return. You know what's coming back is gonna be good. You know what's coming back is gonna be resellable. And it puts you in a much better position to move forward with your inventory, your operations, and really have a very streamlined experience. And so then this brings us to our next question, kind of just changing about and asking what you're doing today. When are you refunding your customers for their return? Okay, we're right at about 50%, but I still see answers streaming in. I'll go ahead and share it. So that kind of passes to Bennett to share off our results and then take us away. Yeah, this is super interesting. I, I would love to know in the breakout rooms, those of you who said other, if you could share, um, you know, at what point you're you're deciding to, to release funds or if you do gift cards, if you do something other than cash back to the payment instrument. But what we're seeing is at return label, only 10% kind of said, hey, we can offer that experience. And then most people by far said, hey, we have to get the box back and then check it. That leads to arguably a point of differentiation, right? Of we, we know that con what consumers want, the number one thing that consumers say they want when they're talking about a returns experience is how quickly do I get my money back and money in the form of my payment method. So I think that's uh, an opportunity potentially for, for some of these, but you, it's a rock and a hard place. Consumers want this. Some folks are able to offer it, but 20% of, to, you know, across the board, 20% of online orders were, were returned. We said earlier, 8% were abusive. So somewhere between one to 2% of returns are abusive. And when we, we take a look at that um, in, in terms of economic impact, it's like 3.7 times that cost of an abusive return is what is, is, what is um, uh, felt by the, the retailer. So this is a pretty big problem. Once you 10X the volume of the returns and the consumers have these expectations, something that used to be you know, a 40 basis point problem is all of a sudden close to a 4% problem when you start multiplying it out. And so that's why so many people, that's why the mainstream media is starting talking about this. That's why so many folks are talking about this um, kind of as a, as a next vector of customer lifetime value. It's also why the fraudsters have, as Ping said, started like getting in on the game, right? It, this used to not be a business um, that fraudsters would, would participate in and, and now it's becoming one. So the... I have, I have one fun story and then we should get to, to our breakout rooms, but um, I can't emphasize enough to kind of bring it back to, you know, it's the whole chain. You have to look at things holistically. One of my favorite examples of, um, of, of returns fraud 
is this bananas to TVs story for, for a big box retailer that um, they would treat different orders for produce, especially organic produce differently than they would treat any other order. And so these professional returning rings figure that out. And what they would do is they would order pallets of organic bananas to pick up. And then they would also order a couple TVs. They would then pick the order up, return the bananas and keep the TVs. And then actually never end up paying for like the vast majority of, of that, that good, right? From that perspective. And so they would, they would use the logistics chain of kind of, hey, I need this fast. It's, it's bananas, right? Oh, and I also want this TV too, or this, these PS5s or, you know, whatever the, the item is that would sell the easiest on the, on the, the secondary market. So don't just think of this as returns, right? It's, it's never as simple as that because again, the, the folks who are trying to steal, like they genuinely don't care how, how they get that item uh, from that perspective. They'll, they'll use bananas to get to the TVs if they need to. So um, I think we're gonna break out into the rooms now. I think through the magic of Zoom, it's just gonna happen. So I think Biggie, can we, can we do that? Yes, all right. You click the join and you'll be taken to your breakout room. All right, Eleanor, I think you're up. Perfect, thanks, Bennett. So I hope that everybody had a chance to talk about stuff. We talked a lot about our returns horror stories. Um, my horror story in particular was when I grabbed a pair of used underwear out of a pair of pants by accident. That was alarming. Um, so kind of, what Signified has done to really address this particular problem for our merchants is we have um, a tool and a product called Return Abuse Prevention, where what we want to do is we want to empower you to have the best possible experience for your great customers so that you have a customer for life. But then what we want to do is give you the confidence knowing that Signified has your back. So for anyone who's not great, we can segment them into a different return stream. So we have an automated platform called Decision Center where you can come in and customize outcomes according to what you want with a combination of Signified's network data about how people are behaving elsewhere along with what you're seeing in your particular customer set. And then all of this is completely automated. So everyone from your customer service team to a self-service form on your platform will get the same action in an immediate response on how to proceed with their return. And so really what we do with a good solution and what we are very confident that we do for everyone is we mitigate your losses while improving your customer experience. So you're going to reduce all of these write downs that have to happen because of bad inventory. You're spending less money on labor because your customer service and operation teams are streamlined and what they need to do for returns. Um, you know the product that's coming back is going to be good, so all of that shrink that happens occasionally or all of these out-of-season items that people are hoarding aren't going to go on sold anymore. And then kind of like we mentioned, all of this is automated. So these days of getting a ticket of someone saying, I need to return this, and then you have to investigate everything that's going on, goes away. We give you that action on what to do at the click of a button. And just kind of as an example of the network of merchants that we work with, we work with many, many brands um, across the whole arena in many different verticals. We're the most deployed solution on the IR 1000. So we have huge names that are sending us their data that everyone can take advantage of with our machine learning platform. Awesome. Thanks so much, Eleanor. Love the the concept of a it's you know it's us versus the bad guys, right? Um, and and that element of of what we do is is kind of fun too. So wrapping up, um, I think that there will be a cocktail or mocktail kit, um, you know, along your way for those of you who participated. So we're going to give you one last chance. If you hadn't gotten into a poll, please please do so. This is how we'll be able to do that. I think we have to clarify alcohol is not provided with the kit. But um, I, I, I hopefully you got some of your own to mix with this. We'd love to to get some um, some marketing feedback of like that. We also would love to know uh, kind of what is most interesting to you all to to hear about um, next um, from a from a crimes and cocktail. So 
You can talk about like a pre-purchase IPO, uh, sorry, <laughs> pre-purchase ATO. Um, I have IPOs on the brain. Uh, pre-purchase ATO uh, from that perspective of, hey, like bot attacks and all that kind of stuff. Um, what about, um, you know, hey, how do I manage promotions and limited products, right, from that? What, what, is it, what does a sophisticated fraud ring like look like? How, how, who's the CEO? How do they make money? How do they, what are their cogs, right? Um, the business model, right, of, of that fraud ring, what would we do there? Um, what about how do we do manual review? Like, wh what does that look like, you know, in 2022? Are people still doing manual review um, of orders? If so, why? What value does that add? Um, what about just the basics of chargebacks and fraud? Like, what does it mean when it's a 10.4 on Visa and what do I do about it, right? Um, all those types of things, we, we can do that. Looks like that actually is, um, I kind of feel like um, as I was talking about them, people are like, oh yeah, maybe that one, um, especially the business model of a fraud ring. I, I nerd out on that one. I think that's really neat <clears throat> um, about how they get the stuff and how they, you know, manufacture the, the identities and then they, you know, send flowers to sweet little ladies over 60 and convince them that they're real people. Like, some really dark stuff, but very interesting anyway. Okay, with that, we are four minutes over, and I think that we have had a successful foray into refunds. Hopefully, this was interesting. Um, ask, you know, in the poll, say if you want your gift, we'll send it your way. Um, we'll send you all the state of commerce report, so you have that. Um, really hope that you all had um, some fun in the breakout rooms, maybe saw some faces that you knew and didn't know and able to connect with them. Um, and please reach out if you have any questions and looking forward to the next one. And maybe we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the basics of chargebacks and fraud.